right, it looks like our attendees are already beginning. All right, for everyone who's just joining us, we will get started in just a minute. Okay, well, it looks like uh, we might still have a few people joining us, but I think now is a good a time as any to get started. Uh, so welcome everyone to the, the final research colloquium of the semester. Uh, today, I'm delighted to present uh, Professor Courtney Conrad of the University of California, Merced. Uh, and Professor Conrad studies political violence and human rights. Um, in particular, the sort of the interplay between uh, leaders' decisions to repress uh, as well as uh, dissent uh, among the, the public actually in, in in my international security class. We were just discussing her work last week. Um, and I think I see a few of my students here. Uh, hopefully, I'll have some great questions. Um, so the way this is going to work is I will shortly turn off my camera and turn things over to Courtney, who will give her presentation. Um, while she's giving the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A. And I just want to emphasize the Q&A is separate from the chat. The chat will be disabled, but the Q&A should work. Uh, I will moderate those questions. And then uh, when, when Courtney is done, she, uh, I'll, I'll basically uh, ask the, the questions uh, uh, to her and, and we'll, we'll moderate that way. Um, and I think with that, uh, we're, we're ready to turn it over to Professor Conrad. Thank you so much for joining us um, and, and uh, please take it away. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, as, as Tim mentioned, um, I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of California, Merced. And I'm, again, thrilled to be here to tell you about some new work that I'm really excited about and to get your feedback on it. Um, so as Tim mentioned, in most of my research, I study government human rights violations, and in particular, the extent to which institutions can potentially constrain governments from abusing their citizens. So the paper that I'm presenting today, um, and I know the title has shifted a bit, so I apologize for that, but it's the same basic paper, um, is co-authored with Christine Eck and Sophia Hatz at Uppsala University in Sweden. And it's part of a larger set of projects in which Christine and Sophia and I investigate the effect of institutional constraints on a particular repressive agent of the state. Um, and so that's the police. So we also conduct our empirical investigations using data on police behavior in the United States. And so for me, that's been a particularly interesting departure from my previous work, most of which has been um, very cross-national in nature. So in this paper, uh, Christine, Sophie, and I focus on one institutional constraint in particular, and that's the court. So really broadly, we're interested in the question that you see on the screen. So how do police respond to judicial decisions? Now, before I um, narrow that research question just a bit, because I know that one's really broad, um, I want to first talk a little bit about the motivation for the project. So in April 2011, police officers in North Carolina used an electronic control device, or an ECD, um, colloquially, colloquially known as a taser, on a man named Ronald Armstrong. So Mr. Armstrong was mentally ill, and he was tased five times over a period of two minutes because he refused to comply with police directives. Um, and he eventually died as a result of his injuries. Now, Mr. Armstrong's family sued the city of Pinehurst, North Carolina, and in 2016, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a district court's ruling that the police had used excessive force. Now, in particular, the court ruled that pain caused by a taser 
constitutes an excessive use of force in violation of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, unless a person constitutes, and I quote here, an immediate safety risk. Now, just as importantly as that decision um, was another part of the decision, and that's that the officers in the particular incident were not held to be personally accountable. So the court ruled that they were qualified to legal immunity because the conditions under which taser use is legal were not clearly established under the law. So the Supreme Court refused to hear the case, um, but it still got a lot of national attention. And in particular, if you were to ask a police officer in North Carolina or South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, so these are the states where that Fourth Circuit ruling applies, um, police officers in those states would be very familiar with the court's decision. Um, so immediately following the ruling, the North Carolina Justice Academy advised law enforcement agencies of the change to law. Um, so you can see sort of part of their memo on the screen. So so did the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy and various other training organizations throughout states within the circuit. So again, this quotation is kind of an example from a training memo of an attempt to disseminate information about that court case. So here's the broad research question that I opened with today. Now more narrowly in this paper, we're focused on the extent to which court rulings regarding the use of electronic control devices or ECDs. Um, so cases like Armstrong v. Pinehurst that I just discussed, we wanna know the extent to which those court rulings affect police decisions to use force in their interactions with civilians. Now, ECDs are relatively new weapons in the police arsenal. They have been marketed as allowing police officers to subdue individuals without having to resort to additional force, like for example, the use of a firearm. But what's interesting here is that state and local regulations regarding the use of ECDs are highly heterogeneous. Now, this is partly because much of the regulation regarding ECDs has been made at the federal level and circuit courts vary widely in their interpretation of use of force as it applies to tasers. So a second question we're interested in is this. So does uncertainty surrounding the changes in legal consequences affect police use of force? So as a spoiler, um, we argue in this paper that it does, right? So judicial institution, judicial decisions that add uncertainty about the conditions under which the use of ECDs is legal cause escalation and conflict between police officers and civilians. And when more interactions between police officers and civilians lead to conflict, then police officers are more likely to escalate to the use of deadly force. So I want to kind of center this question um, about the effect of these judicial decisions in the literature on courts and government violence. So what do we know about courts and government violence? Well, broadly, effective domestic courts are consistently cited by scholars as key mechanisms for limiting government violations of human rights. And that's more so than legislatures or elections or democracy in general. And even in countries where courts were created for reasons unrelated to the protection of human rights, they can have the unintended effect of holding leaders and their agents accountable uh, for violations of human rights. So scholars argue that government authorities incur consequences and these consequences can range from negative press to policy changes to prison when victims allege in court that their rights have been violated. So we have pretty good cross-national empirical evidence that there's this positive correlation between judicial effectiveness and government respect for human rights. But little attention has been paid to the effect of law and courts on the individual incentives of police officers and prison guards and members of the military. So the agents that are actually delegated uh, the responsibility for engaging with civilians in terms of violence. And so that's what we're really interested in here in this particular paper. So 
policing is subject to a classic principal agent problem in which managers, elected officials, and voters must determine how to motivate officer compliance under conditions of incomplete information. Oops. So in addition to police managers and elected officials and voters in this chain of democratic delegation, we argue that courts play a potentially large role in motivating police officer behavior. The Supreme Court's 1989 decision in Graham v. Connor provides the most important national directive about use of force in the United States. So under Graham, victims' rights under the Fourth Amendment are weighed against the officer or the government's interest in subduing them. Now, the decision in Graham, and I have sort of a pull quote there from the decision, provides police officers with important information regarding use of force that helps them to avoid personal liability for professional behavior. But there's actually quite a bit of a variance um, and sometimes confusing variance in use of force jurisprudence in lower courts. And this is especially true as it relates to the relatively new weapon of an electronic control device. So the 2016 ruling that I mentioned in the Fourth Circuit, Armstrong v. Pinehurst, is only binding in the five states that I mentioned earlier. And other circuits vary really widely in their interpretation of force generally, and again, specifically as it pertains to the use of electronic control devices. Now, the Supreme Court has not yet ruled to establish a national legal precedent, even though Axon, which is the company that makes ECDs sold under the brand name Taser, has explicitly petitioned the court to do so. So what happens then when a court issues a new ruling related to the use of force and specifically related to the use of ECDs? Now, because of the personal liability associated with claims of excessive force, police officers face personal incentives to stay abreast of change legal directives that occur at the hand of the court. Now, information about the implications of these types of rulings helps officers to avoid personal liability for their professional behavior in an environment that can otherwise sometimes be offer information limited. Importantly, politicians and bureaucrats and police managers also face incentives to inform officers about the changes, both to better control their agents and to protect themselves from potential liability. But judicial decisions about the use of force, especially those related to electronic control devices, aren't always clear. So in this paper, we argue that judicial decisions can increase officer uncertainty about the legality of using ECDs as a use of force tool. So I'll uh, so want to consider Armstrong v. Pinehurst, which I mentioned earlier. So that highlights the manner in which judicial decisions can increase police uncertainty about the use of these devices. So as I mentioned, the Fourth Circuit Court decided that the use of an ECD constituted excessive force. But because the law was determined not to be clearly established at the time of the incident, the court offered the police officers qualified immunity such that they were not held personally liable for their interactions with Mr. Armstrong. So let me elaborate on a few reasons why we argue that police officers are likely to feel increases in uncertainty when a court makes a ruling related to the use of ECDs. So first, ECDs are relatively new weapons in the police arsenal. And as I mentioned, the Supreme Court has yet to issue a ruling related to their use. And as a result, ECD jurisprudence in lower courts is changing quickly, and it varies enormously across jurisdictions. So several circuit courts, like the Fourth Circuit we just talked about, use the Graham multi-factor test to determine force based upon the circumstances surrounding a particular event. Other circuits think about the use of force with regard to ECDs really differently. So the Sixth Circuit holds that ECDs always constitute substantial force. 
under all circumstances. So substantial force is force that's reasonably expected to cause great bodily harm, loss of consciousness or death. Um, the Ninth Circuit distinguishes between dart stun mode as an intermediate use of force, which basically means that it's pain that's greater than transitory pain, but not quite substantial pain. Um, and drive stun mode, which is an as yet undetermined use of force in the Ninth Circuit, because not many cases have come before the court that deal with drive stun force. Second, judicial rulings related to the use of force with ECDs are often less than clear. So when case law evolves rapidly, both within and across jurisdictions, judges can issue rulings that both embolden and limit the police use of electronic control devices. And so in these cases, officers receive mixed messages about the legality of ECD use. Officers may have difficulty determining the extent to which any given ruling should inhibit or embolden their particular use of force. Um, qualified immunity, which I mentioned before, makes rulings even more opaque. The Supreme Court ruled in Saucier versus Katz that officers can receive qualified immunity to avoid standing trial if the use of force was determined to be constitutional or the law was not clearly established at the time of force. Um, and in some cases, we see courts failing to rule on the merits of the case, right? Failing to rule whether a given incident was a constitutional or unconstitutional use of force and simply upholding qualified immunity for the officer in question. Third, while police principals face incentives to advise and train officers on changes to the legality of ECD use, they also face personal incentives to avoid prosecution themselves. So consequently, directives from departments and legal counsel are often vague immediately following judicial decisions as principals attempt to protect themselves from liability. So you saw in that sort of piece that I pulled out from the memo in North Carolina where consult with your legal counsel, but the directive on its own is actually pretty limited in terms of what officers should actually be taking from the ruling. So what effects does this type of uncertainty have on the escalation of force? Well, Axon, the company that makes tasers, touts the device as an ideal option for show of force, so tense situations don't escalate into use of force. Um, they go on to say that when the use of force is necessary, taser provides the leading non-lethal option available. Now, if we assume theoretically that Axon is correct, that ECDs are useful tools to de-escalate conflict between police officers and civilians, then what's the effect of decreasing police confidence in the legality of their use? We argue that judicial decisions that increase uncertainty regarding the legality of ECDs have two effects. They lead officers to decrease their use of ECDs and they escalate conflict between officers and civilians as a result. So let me discuss sort of each of those um, in a bit more detail. So first, when officers face uncertainty about the legality of the use of particular tactics, they're less likely to use those tactics. So in the face of geographically variable and quickly changing jurisprudence on the use of ECDs, Officers are likely to respond to new judicial decisions by limiting their use of tasers to avoid civil penalty. Now, uncertainty like this has been shown to lead to changes in police behavior in other contexts that are consistent with this general argument. Um, so in a, in a recent paper, a couple of economists, Stashko and Garrow, show that the introduction of a new district attorney um, so i.e. the introduction of uncertainty about prosecutorial outcomes is associated with decreases in the police use of force. So for us, uncertainty regarding the legality of the use of ECDs leads police to the less risky behavior of limiting their use in their interactions with civilians. Second, if ECDs are useful tools for de-escalation, then limitations on their use will 
result in more situations of escalating conflict between police officers and civilians. Now, not all of these escalating situations will lead to increases in the police use of force, but the number of instances where police engage more lethal weapons than ECDs will increase as the number of escalating situations increase. So if police officers are less likely to de-escalate as a function of judicial decisions, then we expect judicial decisions that increase uncertainty about the legality of ECD use to escalate the police use of force. If ECDs become less attractive as tools of de-escalation, more police citizen interactions will become conflictual. And as more interactions become conflictual, police will be more likely to escalate to the use of deadly force. So this leads us to a testable expectation, um, which is that judicial uncertainty regarding the legality of ECD use causes escalation in police use of force. So to investigate this relationship between judicial uncertainty and the escalation of force, we combine data on US federal court decisions related to ECDs with data on civilians shot and killed by police. Now, our data cover all US states from 2000 to 2019, and the unit of analysis here is the state year. For our purposes, federal court directives related to electronic control devices represent a particularly appealing treatment because the circuit courts are split in their decision-making regarding ECD level of force. So to construct measures of uncertainty surrounding decisions about ECDs, we use publicly available information on ECD jurisprudence that come from um, an organization called Americans for Effective Law Enforcement, so the AELE. So AELE is a research-oriented, nonpartisan organization that supports litigation and education by providing citizens with information on crime and legal topics. So using information provided by AELE, we created two measures of judicial uncertainty regarding the legality of ECD use. So it might be the case that judicial decisions relating to ECDs can create uncertainty regardless of the outcome of the case. So this would mean that like the court's simple attention to the use of ECDs influences officer perceptions. So our first operationalization, uh, judicial decision tries to capture that. So it's a binary variable coded one if a state circuit court issued at least one judicial decision on ECDs in a given year. So again, this, capture, this measure captures any relevant decision made by a circuit court. Now, our second operationalization, restrictive decision, is a binary variable that's only coded one if a circuit court with jurisdiction over a given state issued at least one restrictive judicial decision on ECDs. Um, and again, AELE gives information about cases in which they think there are restrictions placed on officer behavior as a result of these cases. Uh, so from 2000 to 2019, um, AELE reported 163 decisions related to ECDs. 69% of them, so, or sorry, excuse me, 69 of them, so 42% of them uh, were noted as being restrictive toward the use of electronic control devices. So, we use data on police shooting deaths uh, from fatalencounters.org to measure, measure police escalation of force. Um, researchers at Fatal Encounters have generated event data on police killings by aggregating data from other large data sets and by conducting FOIA requests of state, federal, and local law enforcement agencies. Um, so the folks at Fatal Encounters have done a lot of work to validate the incidents in their data. And so as a result, it's widely considered to be the best information available on shooting killings by the police. So we aggregate these data from fatal encounters to the state year, taking the sum of allegations in which a victim has been shot and killed by US police officers. 
So the main measure that we use in the models that I'll show you in a moment, police shooting deaths is a state year count of civilian fatalities via police gunshot. So using these data, we employ a generalized difference in difference design um, with a few caveats. So in general, DID designs are used to estimate the effect of an intervention that affects some observations, but not others. So the effect of the treatment or the independent variable is the difference in before and after levels of the outcome across treated and not treated units. In our case, what we wanna estimate is the within state effect of judicial uncertainty on police shootings deaths, comparing the average before and after a judicial decision increasing uncertainty with the average change in police shooting deaths in state that states that did not have such an increase in uncertainty during the same time period. Now, one of the benefits of testing our expectations at the level of the US state, rather than the level of the circuit court issuing the decision, is that it allows us to better exploit as if random assignment of our treatment variable. So using the state year as our unit of observation lets us investigate the effect of judicial decisions in states from which the original case originated, and more importantly, from states in which the original case did not originate. Now, this is an appealing aspect of our research design because states in which ECD cases originate, right, where officers are accused of violating the Fourth Amendment rights of, of citizens may be systematically different than states where ECD cases failed to originate. So this is also helpful for us because our DID approach depends on the identifying assumption of parallel trends. So that states would have followed the same counterfactual trend had there been no judicial decision increasing the uncertainty of ECD use. Now, again, because increases in judicial uncertainty don't just affect the state from which the case originated, the state from which the case originated, they're applicable to all states under the jurisdiction of a given court. We think that this helps us with the parallel trends assumption. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some tests uh, for the parallel trends assumption in a few moments. So the fact that we have, we think that we have a theoretical reason to believe that we have as a random assignment here is really good for our design. Um, but the application of DID for us is complicated by several characteristics of our variables. Um, so first, there are multiple treatment and control groups and multiple before and after time periods. So we have what's sometimes called differential treatment timing or staggered treatment adoption. Um, so this is a, this figure that you see on the screen shows the timing of our variable of judicial decisions, um, again, in US states from 2000 to 2019 by year. Um, and so for example here, if we look at Delaware, right? So Delaware here in 2000. So Delaware is in the third circuit. You can see that Delaware was treated multiple times. Delaware was treated in 2000, in 2012, in 2013, and in 2016. So these are all years in which the third circuit issued a decision related to ECDs. So the second complicating factor in our data, all states in our sample have been treated by judicial decisions at some point during this time period from 2000 to 2019. So we do not have any never treated units in our sample to use as a straightforward control group. Again, every circuit court of appeals has issued an ECD ruling during this time period. So all states are treated. Um, they're all listed here in this figure at some point. Third complication, once states are treated, they do not remain treated for the rest of the time period. Instead, treatment status, so again, our measures for uncertainty, switches on and off. So it's a reversible treatment. Again, if we look at Delaware, right, it's treated in 2000, but not in 2001. And again in 2013, but not in 2014. 
So when treatment effects are heterogeneous across groups and over time, like these, um, two-way fixed, fixed, fixed effects estimates, which are often used to generate DID estimates, can be severely biased. So we use a relatively new DID method, um, the DID-M estimator. So a couple of benefits of this estimator for us. Um, first is that it deals with reversible treatments by comparing the evolution of outcomes among units that switch treatment status across a pair of consecutive time periods with units that did not switch in the same time period. So the parameter of interest here is the average of those DID comparisons across all pairs of consecutive time periods and across all values of the treatment. So that estimate is an unbiased and consistent estimator of the average treatment effect among the switchers at the time period in which they switch. Um, now, we really like this estimator um, because it's not only methodologically appropriate given that we have a reversible treatment. We also think it's theoretically appropriate for testing our hypothesis because states and, and thus police officers within those states switch in and out of uncertainty with regard to EC judicial decisions. So what do I mean by that? What does it look like for states to switch in and out of uncertainty? Now this figure is a little different than the one I just showed you. So it shows the timing of switching treatment status across US states. So the treatment indicator here is coded one if a state's treatment status, and again, here we're using that same variable for a judicial decision, if it differs from the previous year. So theoretically, it takes into account the fact that uncertainty only exists when there's a change in treatment. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Delaware again. Um, so in the last figure, Delaware was coded as treated in 2000. Um, this, this figure starts in 2001. So in this figure, Delaware is coded as treated in 2001. It wouldn't be coded as treated in 2000. The Third Circuit Court of Appeals issued a judicial decision in 2000, but not in 2001. And as such, Delaware's treatment status switches. Um, so in the switching figure here, Delaware is coded as treated again in 2012. It switches from untreated to treated in that year when the court issues a new decision. Now note that Delaware is not coded as treated in 2013, like it was in the previous figure, because its treat treatment status does not change, it simply remains treated. So here's a summary of some preliminary results using these measures of switching treatment status. So as a reminder, the estimates that are shown here are the average treatment effects among the states that switch treatment status at the year which the switch occurs. So conceptually, this is gonna to correspond to a change in police uncertainty as a result of judicial decisions regarding the legal use of ECDs. Um, standard errors here are calculated via bootstrapping um, and uh, are clustered by state. So this is the estimated average treatment effect or ATE of switching treatment status on judicial decision. So the effect of a change in treatment status for a given state going from having no decision to having any decision and vice versa doesn't reach traditional levels of statistical significance. So substantively, these results suggest that federal circuit court decisions do not lead to uncertainty about the legality of ECD use that causes escalations in the police use of force. Now, this is um, not supportive of our hypothesis, but it's perhaps unsurprising given the admittedly weak nature of that measure of uncertainty, right? So judicial decisions that corroborate previous rulings might be unlikely to increase uncertainty about the legality of the use of a particular tactic. Now, this is the estimated average treatment effect of switching treatment status on restrictive decision. So here we find a statistically significant positive effect. 
So a change in treatment status for a given state going from having no decision or an unrestrictive decision to having a restrictive decision and vice versa has a positive and significant effect on the escalation of force as measured by police shooting deaths. So inconsistent judicial decisions, which are likely to add more uncertainty from the perspective of officers trying to make decisions about the use of ECDs, increased police uses of deadly force by just over one shooting death per treated state year. Now, I mentioned um, that we'd sort of come back to the plausibility of the parallel trends assumption. Um, and so we also calculate placebo estimators to estimate the difference in outcome comparing states switching and not switching their treatment status one year before that change. Um, and so the coefficients here are small and insignificant, which again, lends credibility to this DID design. Um, so I should note too, these are just sort of at T minus one. Um, we're planned to estimate these models with additional placebos um, at T minus two, T minus three, et cetera, um, in future versions of the paper. We also wanted to make sure that our, these empirical results aren't simply a function of changes in levels of policing writ large, rather than changes in escalation in the use of force, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that it's not just the case that police are just sort of policing differently rather than actually engaging in escalation. So here's the effect of our main independent variables on measures of police lethal force and on the total arrest rate. So police lethal force here is a state year count of all reported civilian fatalities at the hand of police, um, including those who were beaten, restrained, intentionally hit with a police vehicle, pepper sprayed, um, or otherwise harmed an individual. Um, basically, any fatalities other than shooting fatalities. Now, using both of these dependent variables, right, so arrest rate and lethal force, it's broadly intended to measure change in the level of policing, and we find null effects. So these results suggest that inconsistent court messages don't simply cause more policing, they only cause escalation in the use of force, which, which we take as lending support to our theory about escalation. Now, our empirical results are supportive of our main hypothesis. So when courts make decisions that change the status quo regarding the legality of ECD use, police officers respond to that uncertainty by hesitating in their use of ECDs, leading to an increased number of escalatory police shooting deaths. Now, Importantly, we don't take this as evidence that police officers are substituting guns for ECDs. They're simply using ECDs yet less in the face of uncertainty, allowing more situations to escalate than would have escalated if ECDs were used earlier. Now we've checked the robustness of these empirical results to the inclusion of the battery of control variables. Um, so that helps us increase the precision of these estimates and account for the time varying characteristics of states. Uh, we've also clustered by circuit court rather than by state and looked at a bunch of other DID estimators, including a basic two-way fixed effects model. Um, and, and these results generally hold up across lots of specifications. Um, so we think this paper makes a few important contributions to, to what we see as previously disparate areas of research. Um, so scholars frequently argue that effective courts constrain government repression broadly um, and police violence specifically, but little attention has been paid to the mechanism by which judiciaries might influence police behavior. So we suggest here that police officers are aware of court rulings and adjust their behavior in the face of uncertainty. And that sort of counterintuitively, sometimes that can lead to more violence, not less. So as a result, we think the paper contributes to a growing literature about how to potentially minimize police violence. So judicial decisions that leave police officers uncertain about the constitutionality of less lethal tactics 
can lead to the escalation of violence. Um, and consequently, the use of more lethal police tactics. So courts should recognize that, that uncertainty, right, while potentially important for purposes of jurisprudence, can affect the behavior of officers in charge of public safety. And sometimes that has unintended consequences. So if uncertainty about consequences limits the extent to which officers are willing to use de-escalation tactics, right, um, then more situations are likely to require this escalatory force. Now, we think this is particularly important. Um, and one of the things we're investigating moving forward is given that the escalation of violence may be disproportionately directed at individuals with particular racial and ethnic identities, ensuring that officers are comfortable using de-escalatory tools like ECDs or conflict de-escalation training, um, et cetera, is really, really important. So in designing training protocols following judicial decisions, police departments and voters and bureaucrats and the politicians that oversee them, right, should be mindful that increasing uncertainty surrounding the use of a de-escalatory tactic um, can potentially have negative externalities for police use of force more broadly. So I think that gets me pretty close to time. Um, so I'll stop there. I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback and, and any questions and comments that you might have. Well, thank you, Courtney. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I have a number of questions, but I want to open it up to the floor. It looks like the, the Q&A has not been populated yet. It might take a minute or two for, for folks to, to type out their questions. Um, uh, I, I think they're starting to, to pop in now. Um, so I have one question here from uh, Valerie Hextra. Uh, thank you, Courtney. Uh, I may have missed the point, but I, I think about uncertainty, for example, in the more liberal Ninth Circuit, but the, the police in California might have a different level of, of certainty than the police in Arizona, both in the Ninth Circuit. I think I had a similar question to this. The idea is, it does the relative sort of reputation in terms of, of ideology, political stance of, of different circuits, does that play a role uh, when, when put in context of the state um, in question uh, in terms of how it might affect police behavior? Yeah, so this is this is a really great question, Valerie. Thank you. Um, so right now, um, empirically and theoretically, to be to be honest, we're assuming that there are, are no differences in sort of, or I shouldn't say we're assuming there are differences. We're assuming that changes in jurisprudence have the same effect in uncertainty across circuits. Right, so we're not taking into consideration currently like the baseline level of uncertainty that officers might feel in a given circuit. Right, so I think you're absolutely right that it's probably the case, right, that and, and certainly is the case, you know, in this that across districts, you mentioned across states, but I think the problem is sort of bigger than that, right? Across circuits, it's probably the case that there are real differences here. Our empirical assumption is just that regardless of sort of the baseline level of uncertainty that officers feel that it will be changed by the same amount as a function of um, a new ruling, right? Um, and so you mentioned this in terms of states and this is absolutely also the case I mentioned, I was responding in terms of circuits, but in terms of states, this is probably also the case, right? So it is potentially the case that there's different levels of uncertainty that we're seeing across, you know, Arizona versus California. Um, and I think part of that is, right, um, you know, there are very different training requirements from state to state for police. And so one of the things that we sort of try to capture in some of our models where we're, you know, controlling for, for more factors is to take into consideration some of those, some of that variance. But the DID model assumes that, kind of assumes that away. Great, thank you. Um, so Jose Cairo has a question. Uh, yeah, first he says, thanks. Uh, following the court rulings, wouldn't police be allowed to use ECDs as the situation escalates before opting to shoot? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you all think generally of this argument. And so the general argument that we're trying to make is that when there's a court ruling that influences 
the extent to which I feel comfortable um, using a taser that I'm just less likely to use that taser, right? I hesitate because I don't want to use that taser. Um, and, and you can imagine sort of a theoretical, sub, I said this is not a substitution argument, but a substitution argument would go, um, you know, if I think, you know, in some circuits, um, you know, I mentioned the Sixth Circuit as an example here, in the Sixth Circuit, the level of force <clears throat> for using a taser is similar to the level of force for shooting a, a gun. And so if I know that I'm uncertain about ECD jurisprudence, then I know that I can be held accountable in the same way for using a gun that I substitute for the use of a gun, right? So that's not what we're arguing. What we're trying to argue is that I'm, as a result of changing jurisprudence with regard to ECDs, I am nervous about using ECDs, right? Because I don't wanna be see the inside of the civil court. And as a result of that, I just don't use the taser, even though I could potentially use the taser. And by not using the taser as a de-escalation tool, my interaction escalates in ways with a civilian that it wouldn't have otherwise escalated, right? Um, and so had I used a taser, right, the counterfactual would be I use a taser and there's no escalation. Right, because there's then escalation, some proportion of those escalatory situations will be ones in which a police officer then has to use a firearm. Um, so again, um, yeah, I, I think, does that answer your question, Jose? I'll let him uh, respond in a moment. I, I think I get it because they could use the taser at the higher level of escalation, but all else equal, the probability of deadly force is higher too, right? Is that? Absolutely, yeah. And so it's, all, it's not an argument that they won't then use the taser. It's not an argument that um, it's that in some subset of the cases that escalate, right? Um, that more and more lethal weapons are then on the table. Um, well, I'll, I'll maybe Jose will want to respond to that. I'll give him a minute. And I'll, I'll also give other folks chances to, to type questions. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll uh, ask one that, that came to mind for me. Uh, so one of the, you know, I, I think one of the arguments for uh, at least attention to, to things like police brutality in recent years has been that since 9-11, you know, there's been a change in police training, you know, away from community policing towards more uh, you know, militarized uh, uh, mindsets, maybe seeing civilians as potential enemies as opposed to, you know, citizens. Um, and that's, I, I don't think that would necessarily be a problem for your model, but I wonder, do you think that there's like an, a, an emerging phenomenon over time as well, uh, where maybe maybe the effects are stronger in more recent years or, or not? Um, that's a great question, Tim. Um, so empirically, I don't know the answer to that question. So empirically, um, we haven't yet looked at whether or not the effects are substantively stronger for some subsets of the temporal domain. Um, so this is this is pure purely speculation. Um, and I actually don't know how it would cut with the military increases in militarization occurring at the same time as I think increases in different types of tools to try to minimize agency loss between police managers and police officers on the street, right? So we're seeing this sort of increase in militarization at the same time that we're seeing, um, you know, an increase in requirements for training, right? So California has increased, you know, domestic violence training that's required annually in the last few years. And that domestic violence training includes training on use of force. Um, we're, you know, we're seeing sort of more and more departments implementing body cams, which, you know, there are trade-offs there, but are at least intended to try to minimize this agency loss um, between police managers and police agents. And so I, I'm, I'm not actually sure, I feel like there might be theoretically cross-cutting things happening here. And so um, I'm not, I have to think a little bit more about what the effect would be given what I see as like cross-cutting pressures. Um, but it's a really interesting question and something that I think we shouldn't think about theoretically and investigate within the data to see whether or not there are these empirical differences across the temporal domain. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that could be easily like an extension. It, it, I mean, cause you just get the average right over, over all the years, which, which is still very meaningful. 
Um, yeah, I was also thinking there could be spatial effects here with like pro geographically proximate circuits that are outside the technical jurisdiction. There's a, so many places you could take it. Um, yeah, one of the things we're sort of interested in doing um, related to the sort of spatial element is um, looking at federal officers, right? And so federal officers that operate across state lines are behold still beholden to the laws of the jurisdiction in which they're operating under these use of force um, rulings. And so looking and seeing whether or not there are changes in behavior of, of federal officers as they sort of go across state lines that might be adjacent to each other, but in different circuits is something that we're sort of interested in taking advantage of moving forward too. Very cool. Well, we have a, a, another question here. Um, Thanks, Courtney. Cool project. Uh, and I think the difference in difference is probably the way to go, uh, but was wondering whether one would need to account for the additive effects more, given that some states are treated various times throughout the time period. Uh, given all the recent work on DAD estimation, I'm just curious if there are ways to incorporate multiple treatments uh, a little bit more. Yeah, so this is a great question, Fabian. Thank you. Um, and so one of the things that has been complicating this project is all of the recent work on DID estimation, right? Um, and so one of the benefits of the recent work on DID estimation is that it allows us to be able to estimate, you know, the fact that we have these reversible treatments and we have these multiple treatments and the fact that um, so a lot of the issues going on with our data. Um, <clears throat> this particular model doesn't account for the additive effects that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, he says, I feel like there's a new estimator every week. I do too. Um, uh, luckily, uh, Sophia is um, sort of our uh, DID guru here on, on this stuff. And so um, I'm thankful for her on this project. Um, so yeah, so this estimator doesn't account for the additive effects. It's assuming that there is no additive effect. Um, and so that substantively, right, what that means is that each switch, either from an unrestrictive case or no case to a restrictive case and back again, provides the same level of uncertainty for the treatment, regardless of like what was going on previously with uncertainty. Um, and so, you know, I think I can make an argument for that, but I think I can also sort of make an argument for where I think you're going with this, which is that, I guess I'd be curious, Fabian, substantively, do you think that more, more switches, right, would increase aggregate uncertainty or decrease aggregate uncertainty? Hmm. You can wait for a moment for it and see if he wants to respond. Um... Because it's interesting, so, so, you know, sort of truth in advertising here, our estimator doesn't account for either, but I'm sort of curious about, um, so more switches increases uncertainty. So the more times that we saw a circuit court going back and forth, increase uncertainty. Okay, that's an interesting, okay. We haven't accounted for that at all at this point, um, but I think it's a really good idea substantively to think about that. Um, and if you have ideas, I'm happy to sort of chat later about if you have ideas, Fabian, about a, an estimator that might allow us to account for that, I'd be really curious to chat about it. Could you get at reinforcing decisions too, where rather than flipping, it's just another decision further pushing in one direction? Okay. Yes. So we've talked quite a bit about different conceptualizations of this switching independent variable. And I think that that is one thing that we want to pursue moving forward, Tim, is that the conceptualization right now assumes that e either a switch in either direction is also going to have the same effect, right? And so what this, we can do with this model is we can sort of disentangle substantively whether or not most of the most of the results are driven by switches because from less restrictive to more restrictive or switches from more restrictive to less restrictive. So we can do that with this estimator. And that's something that I think that we're interested in doing. And that gets a little bit, I think about what you're suggesting, Tim, it doesn't um, answer Fabian's question about sort of like what's happening in an additive way. Oh, he responds again. Uh so you could look if results are robust if one drops a case whenever it would be coded as a second switch. Uh, doesn't get at the additive nature though. 
I like that idea. No, that's a really good idea. That's definitely something that we have not yet done, um, but that we could think about doing moving forward. Um, I like that idea. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Fabian, for that. Um, so we have another question. Um, hello, Courtney, if police are aware, do you think ordinary people are also aware of judicial decisions and might therefore be less reluctant to call the police? I ask uh, because I think you said you checked and found that judicial decisions produce little or no change in arrests or policing activity. That's provocative for me because my mind goes to evidence that people are aware of police force reputations uh, and how people might be inclined to call on other resources to address conflict in their life. Interesting idea. Yeah, so this is a really interesting idea. Um, uh, thank you for this. So this is um, kind of like a hobby horse in some of my other work that like we shouldn't be looking at the effect of institutions on the behavior of one actor without looking at sort of the strategic behavior of another actor, right? We shouldn't be looking at the effect of institutions on government violence without thinking about the effect that those institutions have on what citizens and civilians are doing. Um, and so empirically, we're not accounting for that strategic relationship here. So we don't have any data in these models um, speaking to what changes in behavior are occurring um, for civilians as a result of, of these judicial decisions. Um, you know, the, the, but I do think that you're right that citizens are probably aware of some subset of these rulings. So, you know, the, 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 case, the, main, the motivating case that I used at the, the beginning, so the, the Armstrong case, that's one that was widely reported in, in national news, right? Um, you all probably heard about this one, right? Even if you don't live in the Fourth Circuit, this is something that was like widely reported. Um, but there are a lot of cases that aren't as widely reported that have effects on ECD jurisprudence, but that are disseminated via these training channels um, to police officers. Um, so we're just starting in another point to look at um, whether or not we see reporting of these cases, um, mainly within the districts, or if we see the reporting more broadly. And so that will give us a sense, I think, for how broadly information is being disseminated to, to citizens. Um, you know, I think as far as like empirically, one thing that would be happening, right, if citizens were not calling the police as a result of, of learning this information, right, if citizens were responding in the same way, um, then we might expect in those models where I was concerned about seeing an increase in policing writ large, right, um, we might actually expect to see a decrease in policing, right, if there are fewer citizen police interactions because citizens aren't calling police, then in those placebo models I showed you, we might actually expect to see negative statistically significant effects. Um, and given that we don't see that, that kind of increases my confidence in the fact that police aren't responding to this by over-policing, but they're also not responding to this by under-policing. And if they're not responding to it by under-policing, one potential reason for that, right, might be that citizens aren't changing their behavior in a really drastic way. Great, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Francisco, for that question. Um, we have a question from uh, Kanisha Wright, uh, who will be joining us in August. Uh, great presentation, Courtney. Have you considered focusing on a specific state? It seems likely that influential contextual factors that vary from state to state or even from district to district might impact this relationship. For example, it would be interesting to understand the effects, if any, of racial ethnic makeup of districts, the average experience of police officers, how widespread media attention to rulings are, uh, varying partisan political context, et cetera. Yeah, so these are all really great ideas, Kate. Um, <laughs> I would love, uh, uh, so one of the reasons that we ended up focusing and, and sort of organizing the, the, the research design part of the study the way that we did um, is that we thought that the, the circuit split was a really interesting opportunity for research design purposes. So we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, but there's also just an incredible dearth of data on police violence, right? So even on something like um, police shooting deaths, right? We're sort of, you know, we have fatal encounters and we have several news sources that have collected the Washington Post has some data. There are some other data. We've sort of been promised at the federal level, better data on, um, 
police violence and that sort of has, has yet to come to fruition in really systematic ways. And so one of the reasons why it's difficult to test these arguments within a given state is that it's just really hard to get state level data on this stuff. Um, and in addition, um, there's some, so, you know, there's some, some new work out to suggest um, you know, David Fortunato and his co-authors just had a piece come out that talks about, you know, the relationship between legislative capacity in a given state and then reporting of police violence, um, showing that in states that have a lower legislative capacity, there's just far, far more bias across reporting um, within that state. And so in order to sort of get around some of those murky issues, dealing with sort of heterogeneity in reporting, we sort of, you know, use this, this more systematic data across states. Um, that said, we have been interested in, you know, taking into account like the racial and ethnic makeup of people who were shot and killed by police and seeing whether or not these rulings and this uncertainty has a disproportionate effect um, among different types of victims. Um, and so that's something that we're currently working on now is trying to validate some of these data and figure out whether we can actually um, be competent in deriving from so the fatal encounters data, some of the ascriptive characteristics of the victims. Um, so moving forward, that's something we're sort of interested in doing. Um, but yeah, if, if you, you know, if anyone knows of sort of a state that I'm not aware of that has particularly um, reliable, valid data on, on police violence, then I think I, that'd be a really interesting avenue to pursue. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, we've got a, a few minutes left. If there are, are any final questions that are going to pop in, I'll give it just a second. Well, well, that was a fantastic presentation and a fantastic discussion as well. It sounds like you have, uh, you know, a lot of ways you can take this project forward to 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 uh, uh, subsequent papers, not only this one. So, uh, a very cool. Um, project. And uh, I just want to say thank you, Courtney, so much for joining us. Uh, and, and thanks, everyone, for, for attending our colloquium. Um, and with that, I guess this is our final colloquium of the semester. So uh, I, it's great to have seen you all here. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll do it again soon next semester. Um, well, can I, can I jump in, Tim, and say thank you all so yeah. much? I, I really appreciate it. Um, this is incredible feedback. And I know Christine and Sophia are going to be excited to, to hear your thoughts. And, and again, really, really great ideas. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It's a busy time of semester. All right, everybody, uh, with that, we can, can conclude for the, for the day. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, uh, you know, have a good rest of the week. All right.